So, so yeah, and this actually is revealing one of the things we have to be careful about whenever you are using um, complex numbers. I think I do mention this in the lectures. Um, I don't know how much emphasis I place on it. Uh, it's uh, basically the things you should be mindful of when you are using uh, complex numbers or complex functions to help you with the calculation. So there are things that are okay to do with the complex numbers. Um, so for example, things like addition, subtraction, derivatives, um, integrals, even scalar multiplication are all okay. What these represent are linear. Um, I think that's something that you will get a more detailed definition of when you take linear algebra covered in math uh, 3E. <laughs> so <laughs> let me just leave that there. These are all linear operations, even taking derivatives and integrals. And with these linear operations, certain relationship between the real and the imaginary parts of a complex number is preserved or they are transformed in a predictable, nice way that later on you can do things like a taking the real part and get a number that you would have gotten if you didn't use complex number. So these are all okay things. It's quite a few, which is why using complex number is, um, it's a good thing to do in AT circuit analysis. But what you have to be aware of is that there are things um, not okay with complex numbers. That certain operations that if you do, um, you are going to mess up the relationships. And um, and then you will get a result like this, which is not actually correct. I mean, got some aspects of it correct, but it missed that this whole uh, offset that should have gotten, you should have gotten. And um, I guess I can list the two of them, which is function multiplication and the other, you can kind of guess, function division. Division is kind of a you know, a kind of multiplication. So these things are, um, they will mess up certain things that are set up in a complex number. And these are examples of, the, of things that are not, not linear operation. You can kind of get that, you know, if you have a function that's a function of X and um, a function of X, let's say X. And if you do any of these, then this function will remain in the order of x. But if you do things like multiplication, then you get x squared. That's where it doesn't look linear. <laughs> um, uh, I will let math three do more detailed, mathematically proper uh, discussion of what linearity means and why function multiplication is, is, uh, does not preserve linearity. So, and here's a illustration of how uh, this can go wrong. Uh, imagine you have a function, um, a complex function f um, with the real parameter t as an input. So it's a complex function. Technically, I could do it this way. I could uh, represent it with the real part plus the complex part or imaginary part, technically. And I, so for the purpose of this illustration, uh, if there's a second complex function, which also has a real part and an imaginary part, sometimes you know do, doing this uh, separation can be very complex, but um, imagine that it can be done in principle. Then, then in playing with these is where you can, See, what I mean by these are linear operations. If you do any of these, the real part and the imaginary part will stay separated. Uh, no amount of addition, subtraction, derivatives, integrals. Scalar multiplication is a tricky one because that can actually mix uh, the complex and the, or imaginary and the real part. So this is a, let me just, 
pointed out is somewhat more complicated one. So you can, and let's see for one through four, how they are linear and how if uh, you, know, you took these complex functions, did the addition, subtraction, derivatives, or integrals, and then just took the real part, then you can swap that order of operation and everything will be fine. But let me try doing function multiplication to show you how that all goes wrong. So when you do function multiplication, this is what you get. So multiply complex function t with complex function t, complex function f with a complex function g. And, um, so you know this this is the full algebra. You have to write out the whole thing. And um, you have, the, there are potentially four terms here that I will get from this multiplication. Let me just uh, try to quickly write them all out as quickly as I can. Plus I G uh, complex part or imaginary part. Sorry, I tend to use complex as a synonym of imaginary and that's not technically right. So let me, I'm, you know, I just, uh, need to write out these terms, you know, G times uh, or F times G. So that's one term here, FR times GR. That's fine. That's one of the terms that, you know, I would have gotten uh, as, I'm, as I'm doing just the regular real function multiplication. So I expect you to see this, that's perfectly fine. And uh, let me do FR times uh, I G, uh, complex, then let me try to separate this uh, as I'm writing the terms. So I'm going to write the terms with the imaginary I in, um, in separately here. So I get FR times G complex. And the mixing of this concerns me a little, but you know what? It's in the imaginary part. Imaginary part, I'm going to throw it away later anyway. So maybe I don't care. Oh, okay. Let me keep going. Uh, I have I F complex times G R, so it has a factor of I again, and I get uh, so plus F complex times G R, and you know both the functions of time, and it's in the imaginary part that I'm gonna throw it away later, so maybe it's fine. It's actually not fine, but maybe I'll say it's fine. And this final term is what gives me trouble. I have I FC times I GC, I squared is minus one. So I get this minus F complex times G complex. So it's this term here that makes multiplication not work. So when I did uh, this multiplication, there is uh, this term that came from the, that imaginary part multiplying with the imaginary part that basically changed my real part from what it would have been without the imaginary part. So yeah, so function multiplication, um, not kosher, <laughs> not, not okay thing to do when you are working with a complex number. There may be a very limited set of circumstances where you can, and scalar multiplication might be considered one of those. But um, in general, if you are multiplying a complex function with another complex function, um, you better know what it is you're doing. <laughs> so, Going back here, so then how is using complex number in any way useful? I mean, you know, this problem is not a complicated problem. Uh, I'm just simply calculating power and doing with just the register. I haven't even introduced the capacitors and inductors yet. So if I can, sim if I can do something as simple as com computing power uh, with just the register circuit, the first, so you know, if I had done this, you know, turn current into real part, the voltage into real part, and did a calculation that way, then you know, I would have been fine. But that seems like I then, you know, might as well just uh, deal with the, the trigonometric functions. Why go through the trouble of uh, uh, introducing complex numbers? So there are certain circumstances where I really want to multiply functions together. And if I can't do that, then it feels like, 
you know, it's not worth using complex numbers. So, so let me show you what you can still get out of here uh, while using complex numbers. So there's a very specific way in which you can do multiplication to give you a very specific quantity. And you can do this multiplication in a very easy way. So you might have noticed that as I was talking about this calculation here, where I made sure everything to do with just the real function so that it's all correct. I was very quick to get to the average quantity here. And there's really two reasons. One is that average is really simple. It's constant quantity. It's easy, nice, good to work with. <laughs> That's one. It's, if it's easy and nice, I'm going to consider using it. And two is a lot of times you're actually interested in the average quantity. Uh, imagine like a power in your house. You know, it's a 60 hertz AC circuit, but um, you don't really care about, about the 60 hertz oscillation or I guess 120 hertz oscillation in power usage. In, at the end of the day, what you really care about is either total energy used or very closely related to total energy used. You are interested in average power consumption. So there are circumstances where um, what you really want, so, so I want to make sure I limit myself properly, that I'm not talking about a generic circumstance where you might want to multiply two complex functions together. Um, because if that's what you want to do, there isn't a general solution for that. That's just the limitation of using complex numbers. But you might have a circumstance in which where, let's say, if you have a complex uh, function f and you have a complex function g and um so you know they, they represent uh, oscillatory quantities like this you know let me use the letters i'm already using let's say you are interested in um so both of these the v and i they have their real counterpart so you know the real counterparts v and i let's say you are not necessarily interested in their, um, their direct product. With real functions, you can calculate it, but let's say you don't really want that. What you really want is the average of this product, as in um, the definition of the this average, or um, I guess I had to say, you want, the, uh, you want time average. So, you know, it's a function of time and you want this product uh, that's been averaged over time. So the, the precise mathematical definition of that average would be first to integrate that uh, product as a function of time from zero to some big time t that's many multiples of the um, many multiples of the period and then you divide it by one over t. Um, this is all the summing up of the contributions and then dividing it by t gives you the average. Let's, uh, let's say you are, um, that's the, really the quantity that you are interested in. And uh, you can see from the calculation that I did here that um, that average is actually pretty simple because this cosine term in the average, it's just going to get averaged up. If a t happens to be exactly one period or multi integer multiple of a period, it becomes exactly that. But if a t is a simply a quantity that's much larger than a period, then you can argue through how you know the integral of cosine omega t over the time period is uh, you know some number between minus one and one, and when you divide it by one over t, it becomes vanishingly small for t going to infinity. So. So really the only term that doesn't vanish is one over two. The integral gives a factor of t that gets canceled out and the average simply becomes the magnitudes of v naught times i naught divided by two. And since the result with the real number is so simple, um, I 
you know, watching that, I hope you hope that there's a way to do an equivalent calculation using purely complex num complex functions without ever referring to the, the real version of it. And there is. And this is how you do that calculation. You do the calculation by, um, by doing this. One of the functions, you are going to need to take a complex conjugate. So let me erase all of them. So if you compute this quantity specifically, so uh, let me choose current to, to take the complex conjugate of. So, so the, for the current complex function, I'm going to be dealing with the complex conjugate. And uh, as a quick review reminder, this is uh, what I mean by complex conjugate. So let's say I have some complex number, uh, or let's say I have this, um, and I want the complex conjugate of this quantity. To obtain complex conjugate, all you do is take the imaginary i and change it with a minus i. So this complex conjugate here will be e to the minus i theta, where theta is a real parameter. If theta is not, then that gets con conjugate sign too or splitting it out like this, it becomes cosine of theta minus i sine theta. Once again, if uh, I can treat theta as a real parameter, if it's complex parameter, then <laughs> it gets its own conjugate sign too. Um, so I have uh, i, the complex con or i star, the complex conjugate of the current function. Let me multiply that with the voltage the complex function. When I do this product, this product is going to be, and I showed you specifically for this example that it is, and a claim I will make without proving, because proving it takes time, is that it's generally true whenever your complex functions are um, um, oscillatory in time like this. And what's generally true is, um, so this product will be equal to twice the time average of the product of the real version of these functions. So you saw me write down this time average before. This was equal to the magnitudes divided by two. That was the time average. You saw it in the graphical form here, and you saw the the algebraic version just a couple minutes ago. So, so I guess what I'm claiming with this statement here is when I do this product, it better come out to I naught times V naught. And let's see if it does. Um, let me write this portion out explicitly. So the I complex conjugate is gonna be this, or uh, let me, for the sake of simplicity here, let me just uh, replace this with the I naught. I mean, I know what it is in terms of V naught and R, but let's say I naught. So it's gonna be I naught times E to the minus I omega T times, um, uh, times, <laughs> sorry, I was thinking of something and that distracted me. I'll talk about that after I finish this times um, V naught times e to the i omega t. And when you do this product, you know, do the exponential algebra, you get i naught times V naught. And oh yeah, that's what I said I was gonna get. So so in this specific example, it okay. And the claim I'm making is that this is gonna be generally true whenever these are oscillatory functions of time like this, then I guess if you're like me, I'm a bit of a, a contrarian. And whenever someone claims something, the very first thing I do is I think of counterexamples. <laughs> and that's what, what was distracting me. What was distracting me which, uh, is a case which is not true in this case, but it's something that could be true in a different case. What if it's I naught e to the I two omega t? What if there was something that was forcing the current to, to somehow have double the frequency of voltage? Then um, I guess uh, 
bit of a problem here. So, so when you do that calculation, I think um, you are going to get a number that um, it's not technically real. Um, it is complex. I think if you do another time average with that, like if you do another time average, then it will fix the issue that I'm going to point out. So, you know, it, you will end up with this quantity here, uh, e to the minus i omega t. And if you were to do a time average, then the time average will actually turn out to be zero. And zero is actually physically correct answer. It turns out if this uh, has a double the frequency, then um, some of the time you are dissipating positive power, some of the time you are dissipating negative power, which technically should mean power input, and those average out to zero. Um, but if you don't average, then you have this complex number. And um, yeah, so let me not worry about that. Um, I think uh, make a more limited version of the claim that I think I was trying to make here which you would be. <laughs> so I think, let, let me limit my claim here so that later on you don't find a counter example where uh, you find what I'm saying is wrong. So let me just, because uh, uh, I think I can limit my claim and still make it be useful for our purposes here. So the limited version of claim will be this, uh, where you are dealing with only a single function. So, so, you know, with a single function, you still have the same problem that I was pointing out about how you can't multiply a complex function to another complex function. So if you have, um, let's say, complex voltage source T, then um, what you would get with taking the real part of the complex function squared, what you get here is different from what you would get if you took the real part and then squared what you got there. That's different. Uh, just to do basically the exact same calculation I did before. Um, it's not the same. And, um, and with this limited context, this is the claim that I can make. Um, so, so, you know, even with a, just a single function, you have trouble multiplying the function to itself. Um, you can't, yeah, but again, if uh, the context is that maybe I'm not interested in the square of the function itself. So, you know, if that's what I'm interested in, I'm kind of, uh, or I guess not this. Um, so if uh, what I mean, so if uh, what I'm interested, so this is the real version of the function. If uh, what I'm interested in is the, square of the function itself, um, as in what we would get if I had a V naught squared over R uh, cosine, or, you know, that, so I guess that's cosine squared omega T. So if this actual function of time is what I'm interested in, then, um, sorry, complex functions can help you get there correctly. But let's say I'm not actually interested in that. What I'm interested in is just an average over time or, you know, just write out explicitly, just one over T integral from zero to T over V of T squared DT. If that's what you're interested in, then the complex functions can help you get there because I can say without any um, hesitation or counter examples that work out that this quantity here is gonna be equal to the quantity that I'm writing on the left-hand side. The complex function multiplied to complex conjugate of that function divided by two. And you can see with the example I have up there, if I do this calculation, then, um, so this is what it looks like. Kind of the same thing I did up uh, before with the V naught e to the minus i omega t times V naught e to the i omega t. It's the same calculation I did before. Um, divide by two, so it's a V naught squared over two e to the minus i omega t cancels out with e to the i omega t. The difference from what I did before is that um, B 
because it's the same function to itself, there is no possibility of these two frequencies being different. So this uh, complex uh, factor is uh, guaranteed to cancel out. Um, and, and, and this is equal to the time average um, that you can get if we, you calculated that. And it, it, so, so, and if you, Imagine taking this, multiplying by one over R, that will give you the average power dissipated. So there is a way to get to average power dissipated in AC circuit that uses only complex functions and very simple operations using complex functions only. So never dealing with um, never dealing with anything more complicated than um, complex conjugate operation, which is just replacing i with a minus i, and simple products of complex numbers that uh, can be worked out relatively simply algebraically. So this expression is what I'm gonna be utilizing. Uh, in fact, uh, probably the current version of that, because as I was saying at the beginning, uh, what I prefer uh, whenever I'm calculating power is to use this expression. And one upside here is that it's a function of, uh, or it depends on single function of time only, i of t. And uh, um, so, so it looks like it's gonna work out. Um, yeah, so um, 